Um, we are going to kind of do a, uh, uh, you know, and here's the thing. It's not really a new thing. Uh, it's just a different thing. And that's the, the good thing about our Wednesday nights uh, as we go deeper is that we, we don't really have to model it after anything. We just make it what we want as we go. And that's a lot of fun. And so we're going to go deeper into a series called What About? And what, so this will kind of be a ever developing series as we are in it. I I don't know how long it's going to be. I don't know even what I'm going to talk about next week. And that's, that's exciting because I want us to be going through this together because oftentimes, as I've said, so, you know, whenever I preach, whenever I speak, it's, it's often the third or fourth time that you hear me, it's the, the third or fourth time that day or in the last couple of days that I've spoke the message. And so, so, I, so I preach to myself a lot more than I preach to anybody else. And so, but, but what I want this series to look like is I, I want to really spend some time through this series addressing, when I say some of those churchy questions, those, the, those things that, that a lot of us who've been in church, or maybe you haven't been in church, maybe there's some things that you've heard about the people who have been in church, uh, the way that we do things, why we do things, the, the, the different things that, uh, that, that, that the church just needs to get a grip on. How many of you guys know that sometimes we just need to get a grip? Come on, touch your neighbor and say, get a grip. It's good. We just need to get a grip on some different things. And and that is really the idea behind the series that we're going to be getting involved in. So so here's what I want to do. Anytime this week or next week that you have a churchy question, okay, here's what I want you to do. I I want you to help me preach. I want you to to send us a message at the church, okay? And this is a really easy thing. Um in a moment, whoever's back on the computer, put this slide up, uh, just the email to the church, information at Little Chapel Church, okay? That's going to be the, the email address that you can send it to, or you can message us, message us on Facebook. And simply put in the subject line or at the top of the message, what about? Say, what about so, so that our office uh, admin, so Lynn will know that it's a message that I need to, that I need to read, and ask whatever questions that you have. Ask whatever questions that you may have, and I'll, I'll, I'll read it, I'll look at it, and, and if I feel like it would go within the series, we'll address some of these things, because, because I want us just to go through this together. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. You know, it could be, what about grace? How many of you guys know that grace is amazing? It was so amazing, someone wrote a song about it. Come on. Grace is amazing, and or it's amazing grace, however you want to say it, but how many of you also know that within the church, that, that within the church, grace looks different. People have different views on what the full measure of grace really is. Do you know that? Some people have, 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 have a misconceptualized view that grace, that grace is freedom to just really live however we want with this, mistaken, uh, with this mistaken claim that would say that it's okay because we're under grace, not under the law. Have you ever heard that? It's one of those things that, that it's good, it's true. It's true, but just because we're under grace, Paul said it best, that just because we've received grace doesn't give us a license to live in sin. Amen. But there's this, but there's this, there's this, there's this whole trend that makes grace kind of slippery. But then you can go all the way on the other side, and I don't know why I'm talking about grace tonight because it's not really what I'm preaching about. But I'll, but but I'll, but I'll answer the question: What about grace one night during these series? Because on the other side of the grace spectrum is that is that that there is a that there is such a a, a rigid line on. On, on grace that there's actually grace begins to look like law. And that's not the intention for grace either. Grace is the supernatural empowerment of God to do what we ourselves are incapable of doing. That's grace. To each, you know, in, in Ephesians, Paul talks about that to each there has been a gift of grace given. You have a gift of grace. We've been given a gift of grace. Grace is a gift that's given to the body to do what is impossible to do without him. Grace is amazing. I want to talk about grace. So what about grace? I'm, I'm going to preach about that during this series. 
What else do you want to know about? Let me know, and we'll, and we'll talk about it. Does that sound like fun? That sounds like a blast for me anyway. I'm, I'm going to preach myself happy through this series. It's going to be fun. It's going to give me, it's going to give me uh, direction and, 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 and to study things out because, because I want us to go on this journey together. But tonight, very quickly, in the next 23 and a half minutes, I want to answer this simple question. To really get into the What About series, we need to look at ourselves first, I feel like. We have to be able to answer the questions, what about me? Well, what about me? Where do I fit? What, how, how, how does this, this whole thing that, that Jesus has paid the price to bring me into, what has it done to me? How does it affect me? What should it do to me? How many of you guys know that if I have truly had an encounter with the presence of God and remain unchanged, then guess what? I didn't meet Jesus. You know that's true? If I have really encountered Jesus in a real, tangible way, but leave unchanged and nothing about me has changed, there is a really good chance that I didn't really meet Jesus because Jesus is transforming. When you truly meet him and truly know him, it's impossible to remain the same. He changes our life and alters our eternity whenever we submit to his lordship. Amen? What happened to Paul when he was on the road to Damascus? Jesus, the light of the world, showed up, and it wrecked Paul's life in the best possible way. That's what Jesus does, man. He's a life wrecker, but in a good way. (laughs) He's a life wrecker in a good way. He's wrecked my life in the best possible way. He's wrecked it in the best possible way. That's what he does. He's good, and he's faithful. And so we're going to talk about this, this question tonight. What about you? What about you? And, and I want to encourage you throughout the, the, remainder, the remaining 21 and a half minutes now to, to view this question, what about me, in the context of not just a question but a challenge. Because not only did Jesus pay the price to set you free from sin and, and, and offer you an eternity with him, in heaven forever, but he paid the price that your life would be radically transformed, that you would live as he's called you to be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and to be the light to a dark world. You see, when I'm asking what about you, what what, what I want you to take this, how I want you to view this is asking the question, what about me? What about me? Am I living transformed? Am I exemplifying to the world around me the work of Christ in me? Oh, that was good right there. Larry, that was good. Two Larrys in a row. How about that? <laughs> what about you? What about me? And this is something that I have to, you know, it's internal. We're looking at these things. You know, there's a, um, there's a, a real thing that psychologists uh, describe as the crowd effect. And it's very simply what this crowd effect is what it means is it's, it's, there's been studies done on it, and simply it's that there's a theory that was proven that would say that when the, the bigger a crowd is, the less likely that someone is to step in and do the right thing when something wrong is being done. And there was a uh, and, and this the study began. Um, from an incident that happened in New York, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but in New York, in broad daylight, in the middle of the busy street, a murder was being was taking place. There was a crowd around this victim and this attacker that was happening, and not one person stepped in to save the one who was being attacked. When being interviewed by the police, Every single one had the same reason. Everyone who was interviewed had the same reason why they did nothing, and that reason was because they thought for sure somebody would do something. They thought for sure that somebody would step in and be the one that would, that would help the one who was being attacked. They thought somebody surely would do something. You see, that's an interesting study, and, and, if, and if you ask me, I, I feel like a lot of the church has fallen into the crowd effect. 
I feel like a lot of the church has fallen into the crowd effect. You see, we, we gather in masses on Sundays. We, we gather together. We do things as a church. We do churchy stuff, right? We have potlucks, which are amazing. Thank you, Jesus, for potlucks. Come on, somebody. We, we have events. It's incredible. I love events. We do these big events, and it's awesome. It's all good. Everything we do is good. But yet, what we see so often is the crowd effect taking place place within the church, that the reason we truly do not live our life, here's the thing, I just wonder, does Jesus look at your life and, and, and say, I'm getting everything I paid for out of that one? I'm getting everything I paid for, for that one, out of that one right there. I think about from that for myself, Lord, are you receiving the reward of the price you paid from me? Do you think about that? This is the crowd effect, that we, we come together, which is good. The word tells us to come together. Do not, do, do not forsake the fellowship of believers. We need the church. We need each other. But, but, there's a big but here. But if we only are concerned about the good times we have together and we never take the personal responsibility to do what God is calling us to do and to be the light of the world in our families, in our homes, in our jobs, to the world around us, we are missing it and in, in, in fact falling into the crowd effect, just blending in with the world around us. Come on. I'm not, you know, I'm not being mean to anybody. I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes. Because like I said, I've preached this to myself three times. And even as a pastor, guys, if I can just be really honest, there are times in my life where I find myself falling into the crowd effect. I don't want that for my life. Jesus is worthy to receive everything that he paid for. He paid the price he gave everything so that I would in return give everything to him. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy to receive everything that he paid for. He paid for you. He purchased you. He purchased me with a great price. And for me to think that, my, that, that I, could, I could receive the full measure of what he paid for me and remain unchanged and not be radical for him is crazy. He's worthy of me just going nuts for Jesus every single day. He's worthy. Come on. We need to get away from the empathetic church that just, that just goes through the motions. It's time to give our king what's worthy of his name. And that is a life laid down. Yeah, all for you, Jesus. This is all for you. That's what we're called to. So we're asking, what about you? Are you, are you the one? Are you being the one that Jesus paid for you to be? We see this... Um, we see this in Romans 8, 19. What an awesome verse this is. Romans 8, 19, the word says, For the anxious longing of creation waits for the revealing of the sons of God, the children of God, as some translations say. Creation is anxiously awaiting for the children of God to be revealed, the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. Who is this verse talking to right now? Us, that's exactly right. Creation is waiting for the sons of God, the daughters of God, to arise and shine to the world around them. Why? Because church, brothers, sisters, family, we have what the world desperately needs. Jesus is the answer. 
Jesus is the answer, and all of creation longs for something more. Whether they realize it or not, there is a longing deep in the heart of all creation to know the purpose of why they were created, to know that there is hope whenever there seems to be none, and we have that hope. How selfish do we have to be to hold on to that and never give it away? Do you know that statistics say that 95% of Christians never share their faith with anybody? 95% of Christians never share their faith, never evangelize, never witness, never tell anybody about Jesus. And you have the hope of the world living in you. I know that's not, that, that, if that statistic was taken here, it would be totally off because I'm sure we, you guys are all just walking evangelists everywhere you go. Praise God. What about you, though, seriously? What about you? Are you living as the light of the world? Are you telling people about Jesus? Are you showing people Jesus? Come on. You have the answer. The world The world creation longs for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. Come on. This is a charge to us. It's a charge to you and to me to be the one who God has called me to be. Amen? Is this true? We have to be the one. We have to be the one that he's called us and created to be because the world needs Jesus. <laughs> he's the answer. He's the answer. He's the answer. We need to understand that, that our roles as sons and daughters of God, we need to understand our roles as sons and daughters of God and, and that as such we have a responsibility we have a responsibility to be the one that God can trust, that, 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 that we will be the one, that we will, uh, that we will be the one that God can use to fulfill his will to the ones we encounter. Do you guys know that, 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 uh, that the greatest joy of our life is to partner with him in what he is doing? Jesus said, I only do what I see my father doing. Jesus modeled partnership with his heavenly father perfectly. Jesus demonstrated the heart of God towards humanity, but he also lived revealing the purpose that each and every single one of us are called to in relationship to him. We are called to partner with what God is doing to release his glory on earth as it is in heaven. That's true. Jesus did it very well, and we are called to be in his likeness, to live in his likeness. We are called to be the one. So what about you? To be the one, to be the one, I have to be willing to say, Lord, send me. We have to invite this in our life. We have to invite, we have to invite a willing, we have to invite with a willing heart to say, Lord, use me and send me, and then guess what? When he does, we have to be obedient. We have to be obedient to what he's calling us to do. We have to be willing to be obedient. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 8. And this is what an awesome encounter that the prophet Isaiah was having with the Lord. This this encounter was actually, um, it was the encounter where Isaiah received his prophetic call. It's where he received his prophetic call. And I'm going to talk about this for five minutes, and then we're going to be done so you can go get your kids. Nanette just asked that we pick up the kids by 745, so we have plenty of time. Okay, I can finish this. You believe me? All right. Somebody said no. Uh, Come on. All right. All right, I'm going to restore faith in Jesus' name. Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 8. This is what the prophet says. I saw the Lord seated on the throne. High and lifted up, and and the train of his robe filled the temple with glory. Above him were the seraphim angels with six wings. One called and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh. 
The whole earth is filled with his glory. The foundations shook at his voice, at the voice of the one who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Verse 5, then I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell among the people with unclean lips, and I have seen the king, Yahweh of armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. And I heard the Lord's voice say, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. You see, this, oh, this is so, so amazing what we see here. I love how we can look in the Old Testament and an inferior covenant and still see the results of redemption that Jesus has paid the price to bring us into. We see here at the end, it says that that, that Isaiah's cry was, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. That word unclean could literally be can be can be reduced to the to a to, to the word of wrong actions, sin. He's saying, I am a man full of sin. I'm a man full of sin. And what happens is that there was a, a coal taken from the altar where the fire of God is burning, and the angel came and touched his lips, and the result of a touch was that his iniquity was washed away and his sins were forgiven. Isn't that amazing that that's exactly what happened to us? That when the Lamb of God was slain on the altar, that when we positioned ourselves, when we said, Jesus, yes, with one touch, we were washed and made clean before him. Here's what's amazing. Another thing that's incredible about this. Isaiah is probably like a lot of us. I believe that most of us who are really walking with the Lord, if we're really walking in, in right relationship with Jesus, we have, a, we have an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. I, I believe that, that we feel a desire and a calling to do more. We're hungry for the more of God. But oftentimes, along with this desire, comes a list of disqualifications of why God couldn't use someone like me. Has anyone else given God their list of why he couldn't use someone like you? All right, I'm talking to three people. I'm going to preach to this side then. All right, let's try it again. Has anybody else felt disqualified for God to use because you know you better than anyone else? Come on. We have this desire saying that part of us is saying, wow, Jesus, you are amazing. I just want to be used. I just want to go. But then when we feel like there's a pull, we have this list of reasons why God couldn't use someone like me. Guys, I've had that. I've dealt with that. In fact, whenever the Lord, I, I knew the Lord was calling me in, into, into, into full time, like, like, like this type of ministry, I began to tell God every reason why he couldn't use me in this type of capacity. I, I, I laid it all out there. I said, God, now I, I, I feel it. I, I want it, but I gave God my list of buts. <laughs> that just sounds funny. I gave him my list of why he couldn't use me. Here's Isaiah. Check this out. He sees the glory of God. He's, he's in this vision where he's seeing God, and his response is the same response that any of us would have. He says, woe is me. For I am a man of unclean lips. Whenever you see his righteousness, you recognize his glory. Uh, The only thing that's evident is the things in your life that does not look like him. And he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. In other words, that sin has so filled me that the, the, the produce of my life up to this point is sinful. He's saying, my lips are unclean. He's saying, I speak, I speak things that are unclean. Are you catching this from the word? He says, my lips are unclean. This is his thing. God, I can't even be in your presence because my lips are unclean. 
For I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, the people I hang out with are unclean people. They have unclean lips too. We get together and we talk like about, we, we talk bad. That's just, that's just kind of what he's saying here. My lips are unclean. And the result, the result, right after he says this, the angel takes with tongs a burning coal from the altar of the Lord and he comes and he touches his mouth. He touches his mouth and he says, your iniquity is taken away. Your sins are forgiven. Do you see what has happened right here? The very thing that Isaiah said, you can't use because it's sinful. You can't use because it has a past. You can't use because of what I used to say. God says, when my fire touches it, it's redeemed for my purpose. Come on, somebody. I'm not supposed to preach like this on a Wednesday night, but I'm going to do it anyway. When the fire of God touches your life. It is redeemed and the purpose is birthed. What was Isaiah's purpose? He was a prophet to the nations. The very thing that Isaiah said would disqualify him from God's service was the very thing that the fire touched and God used to touch the nations of the world. That's what his fire does. What about you? Are you offering to him every part of you? Even the parts that don't look pretty. Even the parts that don't seem very good. Even the parts that maybe you've been ashamed of. But if you offer him to him, if you lay him him on the altar before him, his fire will come, purify, and redeem. And it could be that the very thing that you said God could never use becomes the very thing that God utilizes to bring him glory. As I close and as you stand... I know this is too quick, right? I'm having fun anyway. You guys might be ready to go. But here's the thing. I've been there. I know what that's like. Whenever I felt like God was calling me, I said, God, you know me. You know my life. You know my past. But here's the amazing thing that happens when God redeems. When God redeems you. See, when the fire of God touched me, I used to think that my life, my choices, the things that I had done, I used to think that my life would disqualify me from his service. But God's redeeming purpose, when his fire touched my life, it actually became my life and his redemption in my life that has paved the way for literally thousands and thousands and thousands to hear the gospel and respond to his truth. It was that which used to be bound in sin, my life, that was set free by the price that he paid and redeemed with what he's done. It was a life that has been redeemed that has now been able to go forth and share the hope that we have in Jesus. What about you? Are you allowing him to use you in such a way that you would become as he has called you to be, and that is the light of the world. What about you? What about you?